This is Podcast 5, American Roots Music and the Pre-Rock Era. We've introduced the concept of a root genre. Here you can see on this slide that the root genre, sacred music, spawns spirituals. And spirituals spawn country blues and black gospel. Country blues and black gospel music are spawned out of spirituals, but with the clear influence of West African musical traditions. We can look at folk music in the same way. European folk music is the direct root genre to country music and Western music. The difference between these two musics, country and Western, is in the lyric content, in the accents and the timbre of the voices of the performers, and the instruments that they use. And we can look at Euro concert music as a root genre, and the Tin Pan Alley music was a direct outgrowth from this. Tin Pan Alley has supplied an endless stream of American popular music since around the turn of the century. Because American popular music is really a music industry, and because music industries and businesses pay attention to markets and how they react, well, Tin Pan Alley had to react to Americans' thirst for blues and jazz. And so black music worked itself into and crossed over into mainstream popular music through Tin Pan Alley. So it's a very significant, it's a very significant concept in American music history. So we have three root genres for rock and roll. Race music, hillbilly music, and American popular music. Okay, so race music and hillbilly music. You're probably thinking that these terms are stereotypical. Uh, however, this is the way that the music industry described this music at the time, and so this is the way I'm going to describe this music as well. Country blues, or delta blues, this music has its origins in the Mississippi Delta, specifically Clarksdale, Mississippi. There's actually a museum in Clarksdale, Mississippi, if you go there, dedicated to the history of the blues. So the blues, the birth of the blues, we identify with this uh, central uh, southern location, Clarksdale, Mississippi. It's south of Memphis, I believe about an hour and 20 minutes. You pass by Graceland on the way there. Country blues is a very personal music. The blues are influenced by work songs and prison songs. These songs uh, will feature an element of call and response where one person calls out a line and then the group responds and this keeps everybody going and working in rhythm. Well, with an instrument the singer can sing a line and then imitate what they just sang on the guitar, for instance. And so this element of call and response comes into this music that way. The use of pitch in blues music is a lot different than the way that it's used in European concert music. In European concert music, when you sing, you really try to sing a very specific pitch. You're either singing a note from a scale or you're out of tune. In the blues, you can sing almost pitch or pitches in between pitches or slide or glissando from pitch to pitch. So the melodies have more shape to them rather than just individual pitch points along that shape. And you'll hear this in examples. Also, very common, melisma or melismatic improvisational style. What this means is that, that there'll be a long open syllable and the, the singer will slide from many pitches, um, rising and falling. And, of course, the 12-bar blues form. In terms of lyrics, because there's so much pitch sliding and, and, and melismatic improvisation, we get a lot of O oh and O. Oh. Um, the lyrics feature hardship and labor topics, as well as escape, freedom, trains, um, and domestic issues between men 
and women. Now, trains are interesting because, you know, a train is a vehicle that takes you far away. And in the South, the people living in the South in the post-Civil War era um, were experiencing a tremendous amount of hardship. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But a train as an image for a person who perhaps can't afford to ride a train but can imagine that this train could take you uh, away to, from, from this, this hard, hard, hard land. We're going to listen to several examples of blues performers. We'll take three examples. So at this point, open up a window of the YouTube channel and locate the playlist called Blues. Our first performer is Robert Johnson, Crossroads Blues. Notice that his dates, 1911-1938, he lived to be only 27 years old. He was murdered. But uh, this example features a modified 12-bar blues progression, slide guitar, and you'll hear the lyrics. You'll really hear the A-A-B form of the lyrics. I went down to the crossroads, tried to catch a ride. I went down to the crossroads, tried to catch a ride. And then the last phrase then contrasts that. So you'll hear that form. Next, listen to Hey Hey by Big Bill Brunzi. Notice how he picks at the bass strings of the guitar as he plays this. And it's a regular beat pattern. And it it imitates a, a train in the way that chug, 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 chug. He keeps that, that rhythm going. And this emulates the movement of the locomotive. Our next blues performer is Blind Lemon Jefferson. The example is Black Snake Moan. Listen to how he, the, the first note that he sings and how it just kind of soars and then dives and how he imitates that with bending the pitch of the guitar. And you, you'll notice that it, it's not quite a specific pitch. It's not in tune. But it, it is a pitch, and it does have this falling motion to it. The main instrument of accompaniment for black gospel music is the piano or the organ. Why piano or organ? Because those are the instruments that you have in church. However, congregation members may bring small percussion instruments or clap. Many freed slaves went north to cities like Memphis, Chicago, and New York, while others stuck behind and eked out livings, scratching in the soil as sharecroppers. You should probably know what a sharecropper is by now, but just as a review, I'll briefly cover this topic. A sharecropper is somebody who basically rents a piece of land from a larger land owner. And what the sharecropper does is they contribute a certain portion of their yield to the landowner as a form of payment or rent. And so the former slaves were once again kind of in an indentured position where they were sort of at the mercy of these sharecropping landowners. My theory is that this music as a sacred music is extremely expressive and has a real sense of release to it. It's much different than Protestant sacred music at the time. It's improvisational. Um, it features call and response and the same kinds of things we talked about in terms of the blues. One typical trait is song structure, A-A-A-B. This little light of mine as a call I'm going to let it shine as a response. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This call and response is then complemented by let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. The idea of the words of this song, very simple. Um, and it communicates a very simple metaphoric religious message. But this is really important that the words are extremely simple and they're very easy to learn. 
and for people that that uh, don't read and write, you have to teach orally and orally. That is, uh, by speaking and explaining or through the ears or telling a story or singing a song. And that's what this does. It accomplishes it very well. And so this is a very good example of a very simple gospel tune that is designed to be easy to learn. And you can even teach this to children very quickly. This is Mahalia Jackson. She's been an icon in gospel music throughout the 20th century. As a recording artist, as a performing artist, and as a face for gospel music, she has been a demonstrative figure in this music and the disseminating of this music around the world. Go to the YouTube channel now and look up a playlist called Gospel. And in that playlist, look for Sister Rosetta Tharp. And specifically, there's a clip called Didn't It Rain? And in this clip, you're going to see a video. This is It's a truly remarkable video. It was shot, I think, in the early 1960s based on the guitar she's playing. But the chariot delivers her on the other side of the tracks from the audience. And she gets out and she picks up a, a Gibson uh, electric guitar and tears it up and sings this song. And the improvisational style that she brings to this performance, you'll really uh, get a feel for how she uses her voice a lot like an instrument. After you've listened to Rosetta Tharp, and I, I would really watch the whole clip. It, it's really quite extraordinary. It's a historic clip. Um, go to the West Angeles Glorious Is Thy Name and listen to a little bit of this or, or put the cursor somewhere in the center of the tune. And in the middle, towards the end, it really picks up. And you'll hear this call and response as there's a soloist and she is um, singing and improvising. And then the choir is backing her up in this call and response form. And this really demonstrates this call and response very clearly. Tracing the development of jazz involves a tangle of genres that are root genres. There are entire college courses dedicated to the study of jazz history. And so I'm going to really simplify this. And so if you've taken a jazz history course, I apologize for not hitting on all the things that you know are really important uh, in this. But for a rock history course, we just have to get a gist of a few of the main concepts in jazz. One of the significant differences between blues, gospel, and jazz is the use of the instruments. Brass instruments and reed instruments are the most common instruments to use in jazz in its incipient form uh, around the turn of the century. The Civil War in the United States occurred between the years 1861 and 1865. During the Civil War, brass bands were used for pomp and circumstance and to generate a, a fever for recruitment. Brass bands have a history dating all the way back to about 1800. But typically speaking, military bands have been around for as long as we know. Brass bands have been around since about 1800. But the use of music for military purposes has been around for longer than we probably know. During the Civil War, these brass bands were very active, as I said, but after the Civil War, there was no need for the military to pay these brass bands, and so the bands were disbanded, or they broke up. However, the players retained the interest in maintaining the tradition of the brass band And so all these skilled players remained in society. Well, musicians have a thirst for new music and new ways to play their instruments. And so brass band players began to adopt the blues and apply this music to their instruments. And in New Orleans, this resulted in the type of music we call New Orleans jazz, early jazz music. 
The music features a high degree of improvisation and playing an instrument as if you're imitating the voice. And if we think about what the voice does in blues, as we've listened to, uh, lots of rising and falling melody lines, pitches, pitch sliding, um, moving all around the scale. Another style of music that was popular at the time, however, a bit more austere, is ragtime. Scott Joplin was one of the pioneers in ragtime music. Scott Joplin wrote piano rags, ragtime music for the piano. And this music is very distinct in its features. The pianist plays a very steady left-hand accompaniment and a very syncopated, almost improvisatory right-hand part. And so the right hand, very syncopated, juxtaposed with the left hand. The rhythms are infectious and the tunes are catchy. Listen to the example found under jazz. This is new, the band concept. Okay, here we have rhythm section instruments, banjo, piano, percussion, and we have melody instruments, which would be the horns. So the banjo, the piano, and the percussion lay down the steady beat, just like in ragtime, and the other instruments are free to play and improvise in a syncopated fashion against that steady pulse. Tunes of early jazz may be spirituals, they may be popular tunes at the time, but the idea is to take the tune and to perform a new rendition of it with some improvisation. Louis Armstrong was one of the pioneers in this, and listen to the Louis Armstrong track uh, on the playlist under Early Jazz. Because this music features uh, piano and drums and uh, uh, as rhythm instruments and melody instruments, we say the music is homophonic. But there may be many secondary melodies as you might have multiple horns improvising simultaneously. Um, but because of this, we can feature a high degree of call and response between the very various horns that may be playing. Um, as I said, ragtime rhythm, steady bass, um, the tempi may be quite fast. In other words, the, the beat is fast. Now, as I said, American popular music as produced by Tin Pan Alley songwriters required that they follow market interest. And because people were interested in hearing music that was a fusion of some of these new styles like blues and jazz, the Tin Pan Alley market was forced to adapt. And so, two examples in the playlist, Alexander's Ragtime Band by Irving Berlin and W.C. Handy's St. Louis Blues. There's a, a few others in there. And the author mentions uh, White Christmas as an example. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that White Christmas was, uh, I believe, written in 1911. And this is an example of this jazz crossover into American pop music. That's a fascinating fact to know. In the 1930s, the jazz band swelled to include many, many, many more players. And jazz band leaders, such as Woody Herman, um, uh, gave a face to the band and also shaped the band and organized what music was going to be played by the band. And so the band leader had... A, a tremendous amount of artistic control over how this works. Now, this is similar to European concert music where you have a conductor that shapes the sound of the orchestra in such a way that they see fit. About the time of the war, these big bands waned in popularity and many of them pared back the number of musicians they included on tours or they simply disbanded altogether. Guys were going off to war. Um, clubs weren't interested or couldn't pay these big bands because of the onslaught of the Depression and so forth. So there are a lot of reasons why these bands broke up, but the important thing to know is that the big band um, faced its demise about this time. 
So some of these musicians from these big bands formed smaller bands um, that we identify as jump bands. And look for Louis Jordan and the Timpani Five under race music and R&B, I believe it's called, 1940s, 1950s R&B. Um, this music features the essence of the big band jazz sound, but there are just fewer players. At about the same time, another current was forming in Chicago called Chicago Blues. This music lays the ground for artists like Muddy Waters and Halloween Wolf. Uh, Muddy Waters is actually from Clarksdale, Mississippi, just like Robert Johnson, and um, he comes from the breadbasket of the blues. And this music will feature a band and a frontman, and in this case, Muddy Waters. And listen in to the examples of Muddy Waters in the blues playlist. In terms of Muddy Waters, uh, when he picked up the electric guitar when he got to Chicago and started a applying the electric guitar to Chicago blues, he essentially created a new style called electric blues or Chicago electric blues. This music is very hard edged and it's unapologetic. And when you listen to the examples of Muddy Waters uh, in the playlist, I think you'll hear that that this music uh, has a certain a certain raw edge to it. It really sounds new. It sounds refreshing. This, in turn, leads its way to rhythm and blues. Rhythm and blues is a lot like the blues, but the song forms are uh, are, are verse, chorus, verse, chorus, versus the uh, the Chicago blues, which follows the more typical blues traditions in form. There's another piano playing style that is derived straight out of ragtime, and that is boogie-woogie. Like ragtime, this style involves an extremely strict left-hand bass pattern. This bass pattern is oftentimes derived from the 12-bar blues. The uh, boogie-woogie piano player was typically a virtuosic piano player. In other words, when you heard this player, I mean, they knock your socks off. They have a rockin' left hand and a jammin' right hand. The right hand is completely independent from the left hand, but the left hand is laying down the beat, and the right hand is all over the keyboard. This is a key component to rock and roll, that the piano part in early rock will be independent at times from the bass line, unless the lead player, like Jerry Lee Lewis, is a pianist. Go to the Stride Piano playlist in the YouTube channel and look up uh, Jelly, Jelly Roll Morton Finger Breaker as an early example of boogie piano playing. And then uh, take a look at the Medlux Lewis example. And now we move on to hillbilly music. The hillbilly music style traits include strings. This is string band music. Um, guitars dominate. Um, as the lead instrument. However, you might have instruments such as the auto harp, the fiddle. Um, when I say bass fiddle, I mean the stand-up bass. You could have mandolin, banjo. Um, there are a multitude of instruments that are possible, but if you can generally think of this music as being a string band music. When it comes to the country style, hillbilly music, uh, this music has some specific traits. The lyrics <clears throat> uh, will feature family values. Um, this is a direct correlation to religion. 
Um, folklore, like John Henry, um, hard work and the importance of working hard and um, enduring hardship and the payoffs that that will get you in terms of uh, moral values. Hope, hoping for uh, a better tomorrow. Religious themes directly related from sacred music and protest against injustice. Beginning in about 1927, the Carter family recorded a lot of this folk music that uh, was around. And this music um, that they recorded is an excellent example of this style. The Carter family members include Alvin Carter, his wife, Sarah Carter, and their sister-in-law, Mabel Carter. And you'll probably notice in the pictures on the videos that Sarah plays the auto harp. And this instrument is pretty interesting if, you, if you've never seen it before. You simply press down on a bar and you have a series of strings. Um, when you press down on the bar, it, it mutes uh, all of the strings with the exception of the strings that belong to a particular chord or harmony. And so you simply strum across the strings of the auto harp and you press down on the bars to get the chords. It's a fantastically useful instrument for this kind of music. Locate the playlist folk music on the YouTube channel and listen to Sunnyside, the Wabash Cannonball, as well as Under the Weeping Willow. And you get an idea about what this music is like in the earlier part of the 20th century. The country style mu music that is folk music contrasts with western style music. And you'll read in the text that western music is augmented by the uh, radio programs that featured artists like uh, Acuff and um, Jimmy Rogers. And these artists had personas. And it's very clear that this is much different than, than the um, country style. Um, so the western style uh, hillbilly music is much different. In terms of western style music, you'll detect a southern accent out of the musicians that are singing. Um, the lyrics will be uh, focused on southern and cowboy and um, this kind of content. When they perform, they wear con costumes. Um, in terms of live entertainment, they practice their acts, their polish uh, actors, um, and it's not unusual to hear a yodel. Take a minute now to go to the YouTube channel and look up uh, hillbilly music on the playlists and locate the files in that playlist. You should have Roy Acuff, Wabash Cannonball, uh, Gene Autry, The Last Roundup, and Jimmy Rogers, Blue Yodel Number 9. Now, compare what you heard from the earlier part of the 20th century to the 1930s and 40s Western style music from Hank Snow, Hank Williams, and this track from Merle Haggard. Merle's Boogie. <laughs> About 12 o'clock, gonna close the door Can't nobody come or nobody go I got a boogie-woogie feeling Had it all night long When I get that feeling, my mama won't let me come home Tin 
Penn Alley. We have an area in New York City where a lot of music publishers set up shop. If you're familiar with New York City, uh, we're talking about um, between 5th and 6th Avenue in Manhattan, West 28th, uh, West 28th Street. So the story goes like this. If you walk down the street in Tin Pan Alley in this area in New York, you'd hear all these pianos pounding as these songwriters were trying to create the next great hit. In 1930, the Brill Building was built, and this is the building that will produce rock and roll hits in the 1960s um, and even today. But back in the earlier part of the 20th century, the Tin Pan Alley songwriters fueled the vaudeville theater scene with popular music. How this worked is really quite simple. After the songs were written, song pluggers would go down to the vaudeville theaters and plug their new hits. And vaudeville theater operators would either go for it or they would say no. If a song plugger is able to get a song performed at a vaudeville theater that night or even in a close proximity of time, it's possible that an audience will be exposed to that song and then that audience will go and buy the sheet music later. And this was the hope for the Tim Pan Alley music publishing industry, that these songs would turn over and people would purchase sheet music. What most people don't know is that vaudeville theater has a very torrid past. If we look at the previous manifestation of this kind of theater, we discovered that in the 19th century, minstrel shows are the root genre of vaudeville theater. The minstrel show typically spe features music and uh, sketch comedy. The difference between nowadays sketch comedy like on Seinfeld or The Office or some such television program is that these sketch comedies would feature obvious racial stereotypes that would be terribly taboo on today's mainstream television programs. As a matter of fact, white performers would dress up as black men and women by rubbing pigment or shoe polish onto their skin. This is called blackface. They would rub uh, pigment onto the face in order to disguise themselves as if they were black performers. This in itself is kind of like a double entendre. You have a white person dressed up as a black person imitating what a black person is to what a stereotype that is assumed by a white person. It's a very strange uh, uh, type of uh, show and double entendre. It, to our eyes, it is very strange. However, this is the origin of sketch comedy. And it involves music, and it involves acting, and it involves um, people uh, that are trying to create a form of entertainment. <clears throat> Al Jolson was perhaps one of the last of the blackface performers. And as a matter of fact, uh, midway through his career, he determined that blackface performing was no longer acceptable. And he came out on stage one night without the blackface, and the audience loved him just as well. And at that point, blackface was a dying art form. You can see a video of Al Jolson in the, uh, on the YouTube channel. So my point here is that <clears throat> vaudeville theater is very interesting in that during the minstrel period, 
racial stereotyping and sketch comedy based on it is in high demand. During the vaudeville period, same thing. However, mainstream America in the 1950s turns its other cheek and all of a sudden we have a sanitation happen where rhythm and blues is transformed into a music that the music industry feels like mainstream America will find more acceptable. Well, that's all for Podcast 5. I look forward to Podcast 6 in the 1960s. I think that the author does a tremendous job at illustrating 1950s rock and roll, and so I really don't have anything to add to that. Um, so we'll wait till uh, the 1960s, and I'll look forward to communicating with you then.